In this episode of American Greed, El Chapo's American Proteges. The twins were probably the largest cocaine and heroin traffickers Chicago's ever seen. Peter and Jay Flores, two working class Chicago brothers who reached the heights of the drug trade. The twins were directly responsible for moving $2 billion. Earning the trust of the world's most wanted man, notorious international drug lord Joaquin Guzman Loera. We were living every drug dealer's dream. Tonight, Peter and Jay Flores are in hiding. But for the first time on television, their wives are ready to tell the whole story. Our husbands were making $10 million a month in profit. We're talking LeBron James money. It's a life of extravagant cars, private zoos, and gold-plated narco luxury. But when the twins end up in the sights of Uncle Sam, the protégés will make the fateful choice to betray their mentor. And El Chapo's empire will never be the same. It's crystal clear what would happen to you and your family if you didn't do what he wanted. All of a sudden, these men just run in and work down on the floor with AK-47s to our heads. sun comes up on an undisclosed location not far from the U.S.-Mexico border. For the locals, it's another day in paradise. But for one family that crossed the Sinaloa drug cartel, it's another day in hiding. Over the lifespan of their drug empire, our husbands moved 100 tons of cocaine. Meet Olivia and Mia Flores. They've been in hiding ever since their husbands, Peter and Jay Flores, decided to exit the drug trade and cooperate with the U.S. investigation of Joaquin Guzman Loera. AKA El Chapo. Chapo was a very serious man. However, with our husbands, he treated them like his sons. To this day, the Flores family remains in danger, their lives subject to retribution from freelance killers still loyal to Chapo. But Olivia and Mia have agreed to step out of the shadows for the first time to sit down for an exclusive interview with American Greed and open up about their time as cartel wives, married to Peter and Jay, and for better or worse, to the Sinaloa cartel. Our husbands were a huge asset to Chapo Guzman. They were American, they spoke English, and then they spoke Spanish. Our husbands were able to maneuver in both the streets of Chicago all the way up to the mountaintops of Sinaloa, and they were able to navigate both worlds. Navigating both worlds is also something that comes naturally to Olivia and Mia. Long before they were cartel wives, they were daughters to two of Chicago's finest. I come from a family of law enforcement. My father's a police officer. I also come from a family... It's an odd quirk of this storied city that honest cops and criminals often live side by side in Chicago's working class neighborhoods. And like the Capulets and Montagues, their children sometimes fall in love. When you think about somebody in that drug world, you have this vision of somebody being very aggressive, very um, powerful, very vicious. They were just really, really different. Peter and Jay were very polite, very soft-spoken, and they just carried themselves so much different that I didn't understand what they were doing in the drug trade. Peter and Jay's life in the drug trade begins in Chicago's Mexican-American neighborhood called La Vejita, or Little Village. That's where they were born in 1981. And even in the cradle, the twins had a head start on the game. The twins, for lack of a better way to describe it, were born into the drug trade. The twins' father was a known narco trafficker. By day, the twins' father, Margarito Flores, drives a forklift at a local candy factory. But his side hustle is moving loads of narcotics up from Mexico. When the twins were little, they basically served as human cover loads where their father would bring them back and forth across the border, their car seats, or they would sit physically on top of bales of marijuana that were hidden in the car to uh, reduce suspicion as, as the car was going back and forth across the border. When they were children, they were the lookouts for their dad. So they knew about the drug business even before, you know, they went to high school. In the mid-1990s, the twins' father moves back to Mexico, while Peter and Jay stay put in Chicago. Using their father's cartel contacts, the twins begin buying pure, uncut cocaine from Mexican suppliers like El Chapo. But unlike their old man, the Flores twins are innovators when it comes to distribution. And their new ideas pay off in a big way. Before the twins, the cartels would use, like, the Latin kings. And the way that they operated, it was territorial. You owned a territory. And you guarded your territory with guns and blood. 
They broke all the norms. They tapped all the gangs. They made alliances with everybody. Unlike previous generations, the twins began to break down dividing lines in one of America's most segregated cities, doing wholesale business with an emerging market of like-minded buyers. When it comes to money, they see no color. It was just green. So the twins worked with African Americans. They worked with Puerto Rican gangs, as opposed to just Mexican gangs. So they expanded because the twins were not about territory. They were about money. In the end, everybody understood the language of money. They weren't even adults before they were millionaires. As the twins' customer base grows, so does their need for cocaine. They are now buying upwards of 10,000 kilos a month and 2,000 miles away. From his perch atop the Sinaloa cartel, Joaquin Guzman Loera is almost a mythical figure in the drug trade. He was a logistics genius. Jack Riley spent years hunting El Chapo as a senior official at the DEA. His ability uh, to move goods across the border and deliver them in that internal part of the United States was unmatched. El Chapo first pops up on the radar in 1993 with the discovery of his drug tunnels running underneath the U.S.-Mexico border. The fact of the matter is this border that you see here this morning is under siege by drug traffickers. And at this point, significant ties to the Joaquin Guzman organization have been established. He comes up with this crazy idea that end up working for him. Chapo's game-changing innovations run the gamut, from fully engineered tunnels underneath the border to homemade submarines that ferry drugs through the Pacific. It's insane. It's something I've never seen before. And he's seen as untouchable, thanks in part to his daring escape from a Mexico prison in 2001. So what he did was he bribed um, somebody in the laundry unit to smuggle him out in a laundry cart. By 2004, he's thought to traffic nearly $3 billion worth of narcotics around the globe. Still, he wants more, more access to U.S. markets, more money. And in the twins, he sees kindred spirits. He was an innovator himself, and he recognized in the twins that they were smart, that they were really an expanding, just like Chapel. So they had that in common. It was effectively a, a no-brainer business decision to bring them directly in the fold. They basically were granted access into the innermost circle of the cartel. They received the, the most favorable pricing structure that, that the cartel was, was willing to offer. And so from that point on, they became the largest distribution points in the United States for the Sinaloa cartel. With his new Chicago connection, El Chapo taps the assets that originally put the city on the map, an ideal location, and a ready workforce. Chicago was really Chapo's hub. It's in the middle of the country, the rails, the interstates. I mean, that's why many Fortune 500 companies are located in Chicago. Outside of Mexico, Chicago probably ranks third or fourth of the largest Mexican national population. So there's tens of thousands of hardworking Mexicans in Chicago, and Chapo could hide his organization amongst them. So his organization was well entrenched, and there's 100,000 documented street gang members in the Chicago area who largely make their living putting dope on the street, and Chapo used them, if you will, as their subcontractors. The tentacles of the Sinaloa cartel had made it directly into the heart of the United States. Working with Chapo's supply and their own wholesale customers, the twins are eventually moving about two tons and $145 million worth of cocaine a month. With about half of it staying in the Chicago area and the rest pushed on to other parts of the country, throughout the Midwest, to Philadelphia, D.C., New York, and as far north as Canada. The cartel, and it turned into this massive empire. So for Chapo, it was a gold mine. Next on American Greed. When you're making that type of money, it's just you feel like you're invincible. The twins are summoned to a mountaintop in Mexico for a sit-down with El Chapo and a deal with the devil. I mean, you can just imagine that you're going to pay the price for that life. People pay with their lives. In 2003, Chicago twins Peter and Jay Flores are smuggling an unprecedented amount of narcotics from Mexico into the Midwest. They flooded the city of Chicago with drugs, with tons and tons of cocaine. They were in that tunnel from the city cartel to the streets of Chicago in the U.S. The brothers are so good at distribution that the big boss El Chapo decides to tap them for an even more lucrative venture. In 2004, he summons the twins to a meeting in Sinaloa. There's a new product on the cartel's lineup, and the twins are going to distribute it. Opioids were becoming more and more in demand in the United States, and the cartel was smart enough to realize that the profit margins on heroin were dramatically higher than their profit margins on, on cocaine. 
Unlike cocaine, which the Mexican cartels must import from Colombia, heroin can be sourced directly from the poppy fields of Sinaloa. The drug itself may be deadlier, but the economics are simply irresistible. Their production cost was hundreds of dollars, basically, per kilo. At that time, they could sell a kilo of heroin in Chicago for around $55,000. And the tragic consequence was it was the perfect storm for, for the cartel. The demand was there, and the profit margin to them was off the chart. It's 8 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. A vacant lot on Chicago's west side. An undercover camera catches illegal drug sales already underway. Federal agents say these are heroin deals. We began seeing tremendous amounts of high-grade, cheap heroin hit the streets. By 2005, American demand for opioids is skyrocketing. And the addicted are seeking stronger and cheaper stuff wherever they can find it. And when doctors stop prescribing and pharmacists won't fill it, it's expensive on the street. You can't steal it from your grandmother's medicine cabinet all the time. And the next thing down the road is uh, obviously heroin. The seller is the woman in the gray sweatshirt, offering $10 bags of heroin to about a dozen buyers waiting anxiously in line with cash in hand. So we really began to see heroin use go up, overdoses go up, a different population using heroin. Virtually every walk of life, every social economic level, from affluent white suburbs to the inner city, we began seeing high school age kids using heroin, overdosing, and all of those that associate with narcotic trafficking, violent crime, shootings, there were 19 homicides in one weekend, almost 200 shootings, and all of that, in my mind, narcotic-related, he didn't care who died. While Chapo remains far beyond the reach of federal authorities in Chicago, his main light into the U.S. does not. Peter and Jay Flores have been operating below the radar for years, but they are about to feel the heat. The Flores brothers were crucial. The twins were probably the largest cocaine and heroin traffickers Chicago's ever seen that became Chapo's number one customer in the United States. When you're making that type of money, it's just you feel like you're invincible. And in reality, you're going to pay the price for that life. People pay with their lives. The Flores twins' luck runs out in 2005 when one of their wholesale customers gets busted and gives them up to the feds. Peter and Jay are indicted on felony drug charges and a federal warrant is sworn out for their arrest. Our husbands were brought up to elude law enforcement. And them going to prison was like the, their biggest nightmare. The Flores twins are at a crossroads. They are looking at a decade behind bars in the U.S. or a fresh start in their ancestral home south of the border. They were in the middle of this drug conspiracy. They knew that they were going to have to go to prison for 10 years to life. And so they decided to move to Mexico just to avoid going to prison. Next on American Greed. We were living every drug dealer's dream. Four kids from the streets of Chicago living the narco lifestyle in Mexico. It's all fun and games and matching Ferraris until someone gets kidnapped. These men just run in and we're down on the floor with AK-47 to our heads. In the summer of 2005, Peter and Jay Flores, two of the biggest drug traffickers in Chicago history, are feeling the heat. Our husbands ended up being of the United States. They were wanted on a drug conspiracy case, and so they decided to move to Mexico just to avoid going to prison. Peter and Jay take flight to their father's village near Guadalajara with Mia and Olivia in tow. For these American kids from the streets of Chicago, Mexico is a whole new world. And for Olivia, it seems like a new lease on life. I honestly thought that maybe this was going to be a change of life. I just saw the good in J and P, and I really wanted them to just get out of the drug trade. So when we Mexico, I felt like this was a way out, and instead, in reality, they ended up just getting sucked deeper into that world. Operating from Guadalajara, Peter and Jay soon find themselves working even more closely with El Chapo and his partners, an affiliated cartel known as the Beltran Labor Organization, trafficking tons and tons of cocaine into the U.S. In Mexico, Jay was responsible to negotiate the different contracts with the Sinaloa Cartel or the Beltran Labor Organization. They were able to get the drugs on assignment that they would bring up to the United States, whether it was through the bus transmarines, once it made it up to the United States, then Peter would come in and he would handle all of the routes coming from LA to all the cities out east. I mean, they had 200 workers in different cities, and so he had to micromanage them and make sure that there was no mistakes, that there was no risks being taken, just because it could cost them their lives. While in Mexico, the twins and their families live a lavish cartel lifestyle, with luck 
hotel condos, Caribbean vacations, and more cash than they can ever spend. We were living every drug dealer's dream. Our husbands were making millions and millions of dollars. We're talking LeBron James money. They made $10 million a month in profit. So we lived a very lavish lifestyle. The narco culture is very different from the U.S. We were able to live out loud. Our husbands had a warehouse just full of foreign cars. We had a ranch with dancing horses, monkeys, tigers. I mean, we just lived that lifestyle that you see on Instagram. The freedom to spend money frivolously is nice, but the Flores family begins to see the real and steadily rising cost of doing business with gangsters and crooked Mexican cops. Along, you know, with that lifestyle brings a lot of heartache as well. And the more money they made, the more problems they, they had. Every good moment in our family was always overshadowed by a bad moment. And eventually, we were all kidnapped all together. Things get all too real when a Mexican federale recognizes Peter as a wanted American fugitive. When the twins fail to meet the officer's growing demands for bribes to stay in the country, federale snatch the whole family from their seats in a busy nightclub. All of a sudden, these men just run in with black ski masks and AK-47s and work down on the floor with AK-47s to our heads. The Flores family is hustled off to a police station, but the crooked federale threatens them with imminent extradition to the United States. That is. The kidnapper cops get straightened out by the real authority. All of a sudden, the phone rings, and they received a call from Chapo Guzman. In that call, he is like, changed his whole demeanor, and he's like, si, senor, yes, whatever you say. And when he hung up the phone, the Mexican federal agents knew that they couldn't go up against the cartel. And at that point, I knew how important our husbands were to the Sinaloa cartel and the Beltran Labor Organization. They were making them so much money that the cartel was not going to allow them to just but by 2008, the twins have actually become too valuable for their own good. And when the Sinaloa cartel and the Beltran Leyva organization suddenly part ways, the warring drug lords would rather kill them than share them. 63 people have been killed on the Mexican side this year as drug gangs fight for control of key smuggling routes into the U.S. Guadalajara became a bloodbath. And all of a sudden, they were caught in the middle of this terrible violence. You know, they said we're not going to be able to choose. This is not our war to fight. They got themselves in a bind. If they bought from Beltran Leyva, Chapa would, would kill them and kill their families and everybody they know in Mexico. And the opposite would be true. Beltran Leyva uh, knew that they were uh, buying from Chapa. So really, they were caught. So they started feeling the heat in their own backyard. They knew the dynamics of the cartels and the violence. And they knew that they were pressing their luck by staying there only way for them to be free of that was coming back to the U.S. In October 2008, the twins lawyer reaches out to the DEA and the U.S. attorney's offices in Chicago, asking to make a deal. The thing that was most valuable to us were, were recordings that, that led directly to seizures. And so we wanted to basically just turn them into microphones with legs and be able to marry up those recordings with direct seizures of, of drugs and, and an undercover agent posing as a twin's associate takes possession of two shipments of heroin coming to Chicago from Sinaloa. From there, the brothers set up a ruse to get El Chapo himself on the phone. The twins decided to pretend that the quality of um, one of the shipments was poor and the quality of the other shipment was, was good. In reality, that, that was a lie. The, the quality was exactly the same for both loads. But that was the ruse that the twins used to get Chapo on the phone so they could talk about this disparity in quality and, and negotiate a discount in the price. Peter Flores is able to get El Chapo on secret recordings, directly haggling over the price of their heroin deal. Pete was able to extract from Chapo the fact that uh, the heroin, in fact, did come directly from him, that there was a negotiated price. $55,000 per kilo, and Pete used this ruse of the quality disparity to ask Chapo for a discount of $5,000 per kilo. Chapo may be a ruthless drug lord, but he also appears to have a soft spot for his biggest customers. He agrees to grant his American protégés a discount on the merchandise. For the first time ever,
U.S. government has indisputable evidence linking the biggest, most insulated drug kingpin in the world to an actual crime. The recording was immensely powerful evidence to have Chapo in a sort of unguarded setting uh, where he was just himself. They talked very openly uh, about the fact that this heroin shipment existed, that there was a conspiratorial agreement uh, as to the price, and Pete was very, very successful in extracting everything that we needed. ...is a win for the feds, but for the newly pregnant Flores' wives, it's a terrifying... During our husband's cooperation while we were living in Mexico, it was really, really difficult for us. Olivia and I were both pregnant. We still had our husband's associates by our house every day. You know, the Sinaloa cartel is one of the biggest, most violent organizations in the world. We didn't think our family was going to make it out of there alive. Next on American Greed, it's crystal clear what would happen to you and your family if you didn't do what he wanted. The Flores brothers find out the price of betraying El Ch when their father is kidnapped. And there was a note that read, tell those two to stop talking or we'll send you his head. In November 2008, twin brothers Peter and Jay Flores, arguably the richest American drug traffickers in history, won out of the drug business and out of Mexico, where they've been living as fugitives from federal U.S. drug charges. When they decided to cooperate, our husbands were giving up the only life they've ever known. It was very scary. I didn't understand how they were going to pull this off while we're living in Mexico. In cooperation with the U.S. government, they secretly record calls with their drug supplier and leader of the Sinaloa cartel, Chapo Guzman. And Chapo had always been very careful, but he trusted the twins so much they made so much money for the Sinaloa cartel. So they were the only ones that were able to get El Chapo on tape for the DEA. In November 2008, the brothers self-surrendered to the U.S. Marshals in Guadalajara and are flown back to the States. This puts their father in a bad place. He's old school and not willing to play ball with U.S. authorities. Our father-in-law, he, you know, was very upset with his sons for deciding to cooperate. He was upset that his sons became ratas, rats. Their last memory that they had with their father was him calling them cowards because he didn't believe in anyone cooperating. Like he taught them that was probably the worst thing you could possibly ever do. Shortly after their return to the stage, Peter and Jay may have reason to believe that the man who gave them life has paid for their decision with his own. He was kidnapped in an area in, in Mexico that he used to frequent, and there was a note. Um, that, that was left uh, on his car that in Spanish read, tell those two to stop talking or we'll send you his head. He disappears and is presumed to have been murdered. It almost seems like he knew what was going to happen. And I feel like maybe he felt that he needed to pay for their decision and what. Back in Chicago, the Flores twins sit down with federal investigators and give up everything they know about the Sinaloa cartel and their own enterprise in the United States. The bread and butter for the Sinaloa cartel was the use of hidden compartments and tractor trailers that drove right through the old ports of entry. The twins then had a vast network of houses, warehouses, safe houses, all throughout Chicago and the Chicago suburbs. The twins broke down every single moving part of that apparatus, um, where these warehouses were, who, who the truck drivers were, who the supervisors of those truck drivers were. They rented homes in high-class neighborhoods, something Nobody would suspect that a you know million dollar condo is where they were counting drug money. Once the drugs are transported by organizational members, they're turned over to street gangs. Street gangs put those drugs on the street. They take the proceeds. They would give the proceeds back, and it's going back to Mexico the same way the drugs are coming out in the back of a car, an 18 wheeler, a bus. And I think that was even harder than moving the drugs, just because, you know, we're talking street money. We're talking 20s and 10s and 5s. I mean, there was times that they have to fill up, you know, shipping containers just full of money. There was just no limit to how they could bring in the drugs and send back the cash. The government alleges that during three years of working with Chapo, the Flores twins moved nearly two billion in cash from the U.S. to Mexico. The twins' cooperation resulted in an unprecedented judicial case for the federal government. The Northern District of Illinois indictment joined six other
other U.S. districts with their own charges against El Chapo, ranging from cocaine and heroin smuggling to racketeering, organized crime and murder. The U.S. government wants him extradited, but getting him on American soil will be more difficult than they could ever imagine. Next on American Greed, catching the world's most wanted criminal is one thing, keeping him quite another. The day he escaped, and I couldn't believe it. Like, how in God's name could this happen? Chicago, Peter and Jay Flores finally face a reckoning for their life in the drug trade. In other circumstances, their crimes might have earned them a life sentence, but their cooperation in the case against El Chapo is vital and advised them a reduced term of 14 years. When our husbands received the 14-year sentence, it was a hard pill to swallow. But I did understand that for the crimes that they committed, they would have been sitting in life in prison. It was very, very difficult for Olivia and I to acclimate to a new kind of living as well. We had to live on our own with our newborn babies. An and act of cooperation for the Flores twins, testifying against their former drug boss, will come only when El Chapo is captured. And that won't be easy. Here in the mountains of Sinaloa, federal agents are hunting something more than a man. They're hunting a legend. El Chapo was the Mexican Robin Hood. He was adored, idolized. Kids wanted to be him. Kids wanted to work for him. For 13 years, the elusive outlaw has found cover in these mountains, his power and protection deeply rooted in the region's rocky soil and rugged people. The area is very impoverished. Uh, there's really no opportunity. There's no jobs, no, no economy, except the drug economy, unfortunately. That's why most people uh, go into either growing poppy or marijuana, because the land lends itself to that, and the people know that there's one way that they can basically put food on their tables. He really owned everybody around him, and that was his alarm bell. Everybody at some point had allegiance to Chapo or Sinaloa, and because of that, he was able to stay a couple steps ahead of the law. In a bygone era, the so-called Mexican Robin Hood might have remained secluded in his Sherwood forest forever. But in the digital world, Chapo must rely on encrypted servers and BlackBerry messaging to hide his communications. When federal investigators finally hacked the system, Chapo's days in hiding are numbered. Because the cartels believed that these um, communication platforms were, were secure, um, in a lot of ways they, they let their guard down and, and shared information that allowed U.S. law enforcement to learn of their whereabouts. On February 22, 2014, El Chapo's BlackBerry signal is coming from the resort town of Mazatlan at a condo building called the Hotel Miramar. Mexico sends in their elite force, the Mexican Marines, to storm the room where they find Guzman, his wife, and twin daughters. The drug lord runs into the bathroom, then quietly surrenders. Chapo is taken here, to Altiplano, to await trial. It's Mexico's maximum security prison. But U.S. authorities are feeling uneasy about the prison's ability to contain the legendary smuggler. After all, he's already escaped from prison once before. Myself and a couple other guys flew down and we met with the head of the federal police and I told them point blank, this guy's going to tunnel out. You have to pay attention to this you're gonna have to move him you gotta keep him on the move and he essentially said see you later gringo tonight an international manhunt is underway for joaquin guzman nicknamed el chapo and for the second time he just staged a spectacular escape from prison authorities say guzman was last seen on a security camera around 9 p.m entering a shower area in his cell at the high security altiplano prison near mexico city the day he escaped i'll never forget i got the call at three in the morning and i couldn't believe it like how in god's name could this happen from there they he slipped out of camera range through a 20 by 20 inch hole, climbed about 10 yards down a ladder, then entered an elaborate tunnel. That tunnel stretched for about a mile. It surfaced in a... Of El Chapo escaping prison the way he did. El Chapo Guzman, quien como ya dijiste se fugó, that he can manage even maximum security prison and just laugh out loud at everybody and say, you know, sayonara, I got my own little tunnel and I'm out of here. What's clear when you watch that video is that the corruption was just completely endemic. It was everywhere. I mean, it was abundantly clear that the prison officials absolutely knew. It was broadcast all over the world, and it really did just show that he was completely untouchable. This time, Mexican officials are embarrassed all the way to the highest levels of government, and they vow to capture El Chapo once and for all. Next on American Greed, Chapo's going down, but the twins see light at the end of the tunnel. It was absolutely, like, the best day of our life. Six months 
months after Chapo Guzman's brazen escape from prison, Mexican and U.S. agents are closing in on the fugitive, tracking Chapo and his closest associates to a town called Los Mochis and a condo complex where they suspect he might be hiding. And they watch this particular condominium be fortified, steel door, workers going in and out, and they stayed on it. For 60 days, no sign of Chapo. Then one night, the kingpin feels driven to leave the security of his hideout to run a couple of important errands. They went out for tacos and, and uh, porn movies, which, hey, there you go, that, that did him in. I think he eventually felt so comfortable, so untouchable, that he could leave the mountaintop and go and venture into populated areas because he was so insulated. It turned out it was his biggest mistake. Captured on helmet cam video, the Marines force their way through the metal door into the safe house. A shootout ensues, but Chapo is gone. Again, he escaped through the tunnel with his chief of security, but eventually he came up through a sewer, carjacked the car, and the car broke down. And that was enough for uh, the Marines to catch him. This time, Mexican authorities are not taking any chances. This time, they quickly agreed to extradite him to the United States. They knew the corruption in Mexico was so deep. The only jail the Chapo could not escape from was a U.S. jail. The long-awaited trial of El Chapo Guzman tops news feeds around the world. Inside the courtroom, the U.S. Attorney's Office brings a case spanning 25 years of alleged criminal activities, including drug trafficking, firearm charges, and conspiracy to commit murder. The evidence at trial that we introduced are prize. They are a hyper-violent drug gang. The prosecution lays out an overwhelming barrage of evidence, charging that Joaquin Guzman is the top boss of the Sinaloa cartel. Chapo's defense, however, maintains that while he may have dabbled in the drug trade, he is no kingpin. Our position is that Joaquin was not the leader. Uh, he had been uh, involved in, in some activities back in the 80s, that he had seized that activity back in about 1985. But Chapo's defense is undermined by the government's roster of 14 cooperating witnesses, all of whom once had close ties to the kingpin including Chicago twin Peter Flores, who comes face to face with his former drug boss. You can tell El Chapo was surprised, particularly for some people, people that he thought they were close to him. It's like if you trust in your almost son and then your son is testifying against you. That happened with the Flores brothers. So there was a lot of people that he felt betrayed by. So during his testimony, we put into evidence one of the recorded conversations between Flores and Chapo, in which they're discussing sending heroin to the U.S. Because Chapo believed that these communications were completely private, he spoke openly. They were really valuable pieces of evidence because it corroborated all of our cooperators were saying, which is that Chapo was commanding people out in the field to do various things, to send drugs to the U.S. And so it really showed that he was the chief. He was the one at the top. He was the leader. On February 12, 2019, the federal jury sides with the prosecution. Joaquin Guzman Loera is convicted on all but one minor count. The verdict brings a sentence of life in prison plus 30 years. In December 2020, Peter and Jay Flores, the Chicago twins who helped put Chapo away are released from federal prison after serving 12 years of their 14-year sentence. It was absolutely like the best day of our lives. I knew that everything, every obstacle, every tragedy, and every painful moments that we've been through was all worth it. When we drove away, um, my husband just like whispered to us and he just said, don't look back. For El Chapo, there are no such happy endings and no more escapes. The toppled kingpin will spend his remaining days here. 7 solitary confinement at the Supermax lockup in Florence, Colorado. For the Department of Justice, the story does not end with the conviction of El Chapo. Charges continue to be brought against other members of the Sinaloa cartel, including Chapo's wife, 31-year-old Emma Coronel, arrested in February 2021 and charged with conspiracy to distribute illegal substances. The investigation is ongoing, but El Chapo is not going anywhere. He's sitting where he belongs. I often think if you were to ask him, he would probably rather have a rival put a bullet in his head than to be sitting where he is now. And uh, that part makes me feel good.